Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Super Mario Bros. 3. In the last part we finished off World 3 and made a good amount of headway through World 4 and now we're in its second fortress. Now this level is interesting in that there's an entire like half of it I don't explore. Because you can hit this particular block I'm standing on and it'll spawn a P-switch. And I forget if it's immediately on screen when you hit or you have to head left a bit. That spawns a door. It's the first P-Switch door in the series. And that takes you into a level that's very similar to uh, one we'll see, I think, in World... I think it's World 6 or 7. I want to say it's World 7. And what's cool about that is it's a very good way to get coins, but it makes the level go on, like, three times as long. We'll talk more about the specifics of the mechanics of that area when we see the similar-looking area down the line. You do need to beat that fortress, by the way, because it spawns that bridge for us to reach the castle. World 4's airship is where they start getting a little weird. As... They stop being what seems to be some sort of cohesive airship, and at times just being a bunch of wooden planks strewn all over the place. But this one does introduce a new platform mechanic that the later ones... Uh, if they don't all have it, a majority of them do moving forward. We're gonna have these little screw cap looking things and screw threads, like the ones we can see on the bottom right of the screen right now. While those ones have propellers at the end of them, some of them are going to have bolts on them that you can use as platforms, but some of the bolts are more of a blue than the usual gray and white color palette we're seeing on screen right now. You can jump on those to make them move right, but when you jump on them, you start falling through them, so you need to mash the jump button over and over again to make your way across. They're usually used just as ways to avoid more hazardous pathways with, like, what's below us, but they're not used too often to begin with. The biggest problem with these, mechanically to me, is how slowly they move from left to right in this particular game. Uh, other games, though, show up and they're usually quite a bit faster, like new Mario games that are quite a bit faster moving. Uh, but in this game, at least, they're a bit kind in that usually if you have to use one to progress, or if you can use one to progress, period, uh, the screen scrolls at usually a slower speed for those sections because uh, the way Mario game auto scrollers tend to work moving forward is that sometimes they move faster or slower just depending on where in the stage you are it's very rare that you get a stage that's consistently at one speed the entire time I also want to say this might be the first airship stage with a power up at the pipe to the coupling at the end of it uh, cause sometimes there's a hidden one behind it, but often there's one that's just visible there. I wanna say this is the first one where there's just one straight up visible. I might be wrong on that though, because... These are not stages I like to play, or go back to at all. Genuinely, if I go back to Mario 3 at any point in time, I'm not usually playing every level. I am doing the... Get the two warp whistles in World 1, using the warp to World 8, and beat the game within like 20, 30 minutes kind of deal. But welcome to, I believe this is Larry Koopa? He does the same thing as most of his siblings. He jumps a bit higher than most, and I think he actively tries to attack while jumping more often. But he's still a Koopaling. They're not really that hard. At least in this game. Uh, I think the biggest problem with a lot of the Koopalings is they don't really start distinctifying themselves in terms of a boss fight, barring Wendy, until the latter three or four. Whereas in, say, Mario Wii, each of their boss fights, at least the second boss fight, is radically unique and feels more like an end-of-world boss fight. But again, that's part of the thing with growing pains for series. Sometimes they just get better as they go. Greetings. The thief who stole the whistle has escaped to the east on the side of the sand dunes. I've enclosed a jewel that helps protect you, Princess Toadstool. And that's them hinting to the Hammer Brothers behind the one rock you need to hammer in World 2. It is kind of annoying that they give you these hints at times worlds after they're useful so that you can only really use them on the next playthrough or after you've gotten enough game overs. Because I don't think you can use the warp whistles to return to previously beaten worlds, at least not here in the NES version. Maybe you can in All-Stars or Advance. But now we're in World 5, which looks like a pretty small world at the back, but that's because we're only seeing about the first third of it at the moment. Now, I use the tail to fly up here, and I actually mess up how to do this. You can actively fly while you're ducking, in the NES version at least, and that allows you to get into that one tile passageway you saw a moment ago. And at the end of that is a treasure chest containing another music box. Not that it's really useful, but oh well. 
And there's that thing once again where, for some reason, when you hit more than one one-up from a block, they just start despawning. So I just lost out on, like, what, three or four lives? Oh well. World 5, though, is where you should use your P-Wings, if anywhere. Not all of them, I'd say there's maybe only two, three levels, maybe, that they're super useful and Save some of them for World 8. But, uh, this is definitely a place to consider using them. But now we're on to level 5-2, and this one's a bit interesting because there's two radically different ways it can go. Uh, if you don't press a D-pad button here, or if you slowly descend to prevent yourself from falling too far, you can end up on these blocks, and that takes you on to an ultimately shorter pathway through the level that gets you a few extra lives along the way. But if you fall all the way down, that's a giant pitfall that goes into like a, a follow the coins kind of deal, where you can grab some coins doing that, but it ends up in a small underground level, where there's a bunch of piranha plants and pipes that is not very remarkable. I think it's overall faster to go this way, and hey, those extra lives are pretty nice, and plus if you want to, if you got hit in that last room, uh, that brick on the bottom left of this set has a fire flower for you, I think? Yeah. So that can be pretty good. Uh, falling definitely feels a little bit like a don't moment, though. Because if you try to get those extra lives or go onto that side path, you're just, you're missing. You're not missing much, but you, you feel like you messed up, you know? And that can be annoying. Alright, but after this particular toad house, we're on to a bit of a unique level. 4-3 is home to a power-up that wouldn't show up again until... I want to say Mario 3D World? Uh, if not that Mario Maker. And I just find the fact that that happens with so many of the power-ups in this game weird, because so much of the rest of the series takes so many heavy notes from Mario 3, especially like the new Mario games are just new Mario 3s in a lot of ways. So the fact that it took so long for so much of the stuff from this to show back up again is just bizarre to me. Like, I'd say the two landmark games for deciding the future aesthetics of the series... Oh, uh, yeah, there's three. Mario 2 brought in a lot of enemies that would show up on and off. This would bring in a lot of power-ups and ideas, like the world map and stuff. And Yoshi's Island especially decided a lot of the lore and aesthetics for the series moving forward. And the thing is, what's funny about it, the power-up here you could very easily miss, because you can only really grab it if you have a fire flower. Because uniquely in this level, Goombas got some shoes. The Goomba shoe, or the Karibo shoe, as it was uh, noted as in a lot of stuff back when, because Karibo is just the Japanese name for Goomba. You can jump in it, and you can ride along in it. Which doesn't seem that interesting. But, you can destroy enemies by stepping on them that you can't normally do that with while you're in this, like spinies and the bombs, you can walk on munchers. It's basically invincibility that acts as a third HP point. And, it can even kill enemies that aren't in this level that you can't normally kill by stepping on them. It can kill Potabos, the fireballs, Rotodisks, the nuclear waffles from the fortress stages, Chain Chomps, the lotuses from the water levels, and as people found out, that's because there were scrapped and unused levels that this thing showed up in. So it was meant to have more screen time. It just doesn't. And there's always been a part of me that kind of admired it for that. But I also feel like for years it was hyped up as a Mario thing that needed to return when it really wasn't that notable at the same time because it was only in one level. And a part of that is probably just due to the game's legacy. Like how big this game was for the era as a platformer, what it did for the series overall, the fact it basically got a movie to advertise that this game was enormous. And if I recall, it still tops usually pretty high in best games of all times list. Like, uh, I think there was one point where IGN placed it as number one in their all-time games list. I want to say in that final issue of Nintendo Power, where they ranked, like, Top 280-something games of all time? Uh, it was like number... Uh, top 10, I can't remember the exact number. I remember number one was, of course, Ocarina of Time. Because, of course, it would be. This game's place in history is unmistakable, but I feel like because of that, parts of it that aren't exactly remarkable get a bit too much... Not love, but... Energy put behind them, I guess? Moving on, though, uh, the first World 5 Fortress. This level's weird in that it's very cramped in compared to basically any other level of the game. 
uh, visually, it also reminds me a lot of one of the ghost houses from Mario World, but I can't remember which one that was ever off the top of my head. Uh, what's interesting about this level is that you can fly up here with a raccoon leaf or a tanuki suit to skip a little bit of the level, and I always do it not just because of the one-ups you can get, but because you have to climb a staircase there that has a lot of these roto discs, and I just don't like that staircase. I find it weirdly hard to get through without getting hit. Also, this jump to activate this thwomp without getting hit is rough, and you need to be careful because I don't think I've uh, talked about it yet. The lava in these stages is a one-hit kill, so be careful. But Boom Boom is still Boom Boom. Though not for nothing, I do think Mario 3 Boom Boom is the hardest Boom Boom there is. Because whenever he shows up in like the new Mario games, which I think was mostly new Mario U, he's not much of a threat. And whenever he's in a 3D space, uh, unless he's with his girlfriend, he's not much of a threat either. With that though, we're on to a relatively unique level out of the rest of the ones in the game place after I take care of this hammer, brother. Because the next level is the only level in the game that on a single playthrough, without dying, you have the option of playing through multiple times. Not that you really would want to, because it only really comes into play early on in this world if you get a game over, I think. Or no, you always have to go through it if you get a game over, I think. This is World 5 Tower. We need to climb it to reach the rest of the world, but after we get through it, you can enter a pipe that you spawn on at the other end, and you fall back down through a bit of a coin rush that you can technically use to get a lot of extra lives. I've always found this level just very unique because of that, despite the fact it's not very remarkable otherwise. And I've always kind of wished they would do more of this concept in the rest of the series. Like, the closest you get is the occasional world transition in some of the new Mario games and some of the RPGs. Like, this tower in concept to me feels very weirdly Mario RPG. The uh, Super Mario RPG in particular, rather. I guess on that topic, something I'm kind of surprised about overall, besides the occasional port like uh, Mario Advance or All-Stars, I'm really genuinely surprised Nintendo has never moved to remake a Mario game. Like, they'll do HD remasters every now and then, but they've never really done an outright remake from memory outside of, like, Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story, have they? Not that I can think of, easily, at least. And in that regard, it's a little surprising given how... they love to remake Zelda every here and there. And, uh, how people really hope they're doing that remake of Metroid Prime Trilogy that's been rumored for... uh, Chicks Watch three years now? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll believe when I see it. Now that we're through the tower, though, uh, the true theme of this world is revealed. This is a sky world. And because of that, the latter half of it's honestly pretty dangerous in that there's almost always a threat of bottomless pits below you, but if you have a lot of raccoon leaves, you can just avoid the main hazard by flying over it all, especially if you have those extra P-Wings. The other big threat is that they try to use a lot of these, I think they're just called rotary bars, uh, throughout these stages, and I, we saw some of those, I think, in some of the water levels in the game earlier on, like World 2 or 3. Uh, but they're a bit quirky in how they work in that they spin and you just kind of get flung off in a seemingly random direction. And it's real annoying. I don't like them. While 5-4 isn't much of note though, 5-5 five, five does have some interesting stuff in it. Namely, this is another level where if you collect a certain amount of coins, a white mushroom house will spawn nearby. This one I believe contains a P-Wing. You need to get 28 coins throughout this stage. What's interesting about it is that it's a very easy place to come and get a Tanuki suit. If you can replay the levels, that is. Uh, which you can only do in Mario Advance, or Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3, which... Very awkward name scheme, by the way. Overall, though, the level goes by pretty quickly, as I've said most do in the game. I guess on that note, I'm not sure how I prefer my platformers overall. I'm not- I, I want to say I prefer games that have fewer levels that are better designed, but having a lot of levels in the game is a pretty good draw as well. I guess it just comes down to how much better designed the fewer levels are than the more. Because every now and then, obviously, like, you're probably gonna have a few levels that are just lesser designed because either you don't spend as much time on them, or there's deadlines getting in close, or things like that. I guess that's probably why I overall tend to prefer Mega Man as a platformer to a lot of other things, is you at most have 
like, what, 16 to 20 stages, if even? And usually, even if they have some bullshit designs, like I'm looking at UX6, there's at least a solid theme to each level. Speaking of solid theme, here we actually got a bit of a new one. Uh, I actually forget what the name of these particular enemies are, but stepping on them makes them fall down. You need to be careful about stepping on them for too long because there's a bottomless pit below you, and it's an auto-scroller, and they're your main platforms. If there are three levels, I recommend using a P-Wing in this level, in this world, rather. Uh, it's 5-4, uh, the first part of the sky part. This, and uh, I think it's 5-8, that's the really annoying one. No, 5-9, five, 5-9, nine, five, nine. it's 5-9. I also got a new enemy here, I think this is a fire chump? It's a weird chain chump clone that flies around and spews fire at you for a few moments, but when it runs out of fire in its tail, it tries to home into you and eventually explodes like a ba bomb. Honestly, it's a surprisingly threatening enemy if there's more than one of them. If there's just one, no problem. Two, fear. You know, I do find myself wondering at this point. Uh, this LP is eight videos long. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, of course. I do wonder if it would have been like a solid video, a video and a half shorter, if I hadn't gone for every spade panel I see, barring the ones in like World Four. But I think I go. I think I avoid a few in World Seven as well. I just I like seeing the map get cleared out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Except when I get mushrooms. Mushrooms are easily the most worthless power up to get out of these. Because you don't have any attacks, you don't have any extra platform, thing. it's just an extra hit point. I guess, technically, Starmen are more useless, because those are only active for, like, what? 10 seconds? <laughs> uh, after you start the level? Except in this case, because this is a case where if you enter with the Starman, you can just infinitely combo Starmen to the end of the stage, just about. Making any kind of threat this would have, uh, none. There are uh, zero threat. Negative threat. I am the threat. I am the storm that is approaching. And you can use it to get some one-ups probably out of the Lakitu, if you're quick enough. Honestly, I kind of find that hard to do because Mario 3, it controls well for an NES game, but there is definitely still some NES momentum going on here where you don't feel like you have very fluid control over your jump. Mario World is definitely, I think, peak 2D Mario control uh, that they wouldn't reach again probably until... New Mario U? There's a certain stiffness that's just present there. Like, I guess the way I want to phrase it is the best controlling NES platformers usually control worse than the best controlling Super Nintendo platformers just in general. You get the occasional great one, like Mega Man controls overall, I'd say, very sharply. Uh, and when they decided to let you have momentum control and, uh... Castlevania 3 when you're playing as Grant, it controls great. Like, I think the stiffest out of all the main platformers that were like well regarded on the NES at least is definitely either Castlevania or Ninja Gaiden 1. Here we go, now that we're in the sky, Boom Boom has learned to fly. He can fly up in the sky, swoop back and forth, and just try to hit you on the way down. With that said, He's still Boom Boom, and usually the wings only last for a hit point or two, so you don't need to worry too much. Oh boy, a music box. I would just use those, by the way, whenever you get them, because if you have a Fire Flower, especially the Hammer Brothers are never a threat, so you can just use them to get rid of the inventory spaces. I call it an abomination. Alright, 5-8. Which level is this? Okay, it's this one. This is just a massive running simulator. Run fast, but be careful about the small platforms and that Lakitu's here trying to throw the spinies at you. If anything, I would let him, when he's actively tracking onto you like that, let him get ahead of you a bit so you don't end up running face first into a spiny. But you can use this end of the level to actively grind for lives, I guess. But with that, I'm gonna need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 5, we're gonna finish off World 5 and head to World 6. Are you noticing a pattern here? See you guys then.